Hey, Dave, how you doing today? Very well. Absolutely. So excited to be back with you here for the uh, the Browns for how many is this? Is this this is the tenth pick already, huh? This is the tenth time that we've had this platform where innovator innovators even gather and uh, share their insights with us. It's fantastic. So excited to be back with you, and uh, we got another great round of innovators here. And today and tomorrow, we're competing uh, for a chance to move on to the finals at Loke Worldwide 44 on June 10th. So just in case with all the virtual events going on, you're not sure where you are, you're attending pick number 10. This is preliminary round number one. Hopefully it's where you're meant to be. Um, <laughs> if not, feel free to stick around anyway. Um, so has it really been that long? Well, yes, it has. We're looking forward to uh, a new group of innovators. We have 10 who are going to be pitching over the next two days. Uh, today we have five of them. And here are some of the that variety of innovations that we typically see at the pick. Uh, and here's some of them here. You're, you're going to hear from conjurers. You're, you're going to hear about self-driving NLP cars. Content philosophy, what does that mean? Lock, lock effectiveness, that was a good one that we see here at the pick from time to time. Of course, we're going to hear about honey i shrunk the pieces uh which you'll find out about tomorrow if you join a new session so uh first let's have a look at how this all works uh what are the rules as we say in dublin well each innovator has three minutes to pitch their innovative idea uh we've asked them to keep the number of slides low so around three slides and we've got three dragons um that's it good makes sense right well in my head when we came up with it. Our dragons today, very glad to welcome uh, Yuka Nakasone, uh, Jim Compton, Hokim Hummel, and uh, dragons, you're very welcome. Welcome, dragons. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So I'm Dave, Ru Dave Ruan, and my co host, of course, co producer, and uh, guy who keeps us on track is Alex Burnett. I'll try. <laughs> Once more onto the breach, Alex. Oh, yes. So, you know, we couldn't think of a better way to spend just under an hour. Maybe you, you have better ways of spending your hours, whether it's with two bottles of wine or uh, doing something the doctor has told you to do. Um, here's what we're going to cover. We have um, speakers, some of whom have been here before, some new names, some familiar faces. Um, welcome to everybody and good luck to you all. Uh, small talk is done. Let the pick begin. And uh, Takeyoshi san, please join us on stage. Hi. So you heard... Nice to see you all. Nice Hi, to Takeyoshi. have you back here. Stage is yours. Okay. So the timer starts. Whenever you begin. Oh, okay. Hello. My name is Takeyoshi Nakayama from Human Science. Human Science provides e learning system content and localization. Today, I will show you the transcription solution for e-learning content. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Okay. Articulate Storyline is almost a standard application for creating e-learning content. The problem is that for a single Storyline project, there can be over 100 audio and video files spread over dozens of story content folders, as we see on the left side. Manually handling all the files is time consuming and error prone, and manually transcribing is expensive. Next slide, please. So we have developed a Windows application all you have to do is drag and drop the root published folder of the Storyline project. The application will load all of the audio and video files while keeping the folder structure. If you press Start button, the machine transcribed subtitle files in SRT format with the correct timestamps are generated in respective folders eliminating the need for human transcription. In addition, the application supports the glossary. If you have special terminology, such as product names 
and surface names, they are correctly transcribed. You may wonder why we developed an application for Windows instead of web services. The reason is that the web services have problems in handling the folder tree structure and uploading the large amount of audio and video files takes too much time. Next slide, please. The result, the transcription step for a project with one hour worth of audio and video files, which took two days by human, now takes only 20 minutes by machine, saving a lot of time and cost. And there is an additional benefit. Thanks to its speed, we can transcribe even before the project actually starts. We can base our localization estimates on the actual number of words instead of guessing from the duration of the audio and video, making the estimates more accurate. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Takeyoshi-san, uh, I'm sure we're going to have some questions for you. Uh, so let me pass over to the dragons. And who's got the first question? Dave, just before we pass it over to the dragons too, I wanted to mention that this is interactive. Um, if you have a, a question for ours, feel free to submit it in the, the chat window. Uh, please do us a favor and, and, and put the first name of the innovator just in case uh, we get confused as to who the questions are for. But we'll take your, your audience questions if we have time. So. Um, I can ask a question. Uh, Go for it, Jim. This is uh, Jim. Um, uh, Takeyoshi, it sounds like the, the machine transcription part of your solution is a, is a significant part of it. Um, is this something that, uh, is your application doing this? Or are you using some uh, other, fun calling some other um, functionality? Yeah, good question. Actually, we use Google transcription because they, they have good quality. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then my follow-up question, I guess, is um, this sounds like this would be useful to uh, art people who use Articulate Storyline. Is this a, an application that you've made available um, outside of your company, or is this uh, only used within your company? Uh, currently inside my company, but yeah, I'm willing to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so if you're interested, please contact us. Uh, this is your address or my, my address. Yeah. Can, can I ask, a, ask one question? That I, yes. I, I know uh, your company is from Japan, so you're presenting in English, but uh, is it for multilingual? I mean, you can, you can use this for Japanese as a, you know, source standard? Yes, yes, okay. actually, like, uh, the Google transcription services supports so many language pairs or languages. So if they support it, the application supports it. Okay, thank you. Great. I have a question. You said you, you use a Windows application instead of web service for, because the files are so big, but I assume that typically a lot of people are working on these projects. Doesn't this make sharing much more difficult? Yeah, that's the problem. So basically, uh, in the my localization company, there is a file server. So we share it over the local file server. And, and additionally, like I use Google, like I said, but I don't upload the video. Instead, I just extract the audio part of the video. So yeah, it's quick. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Takeyoshi. And Dragons, I, th I think we can move on. So thank you once again. Great to see you at a pick again. Thanks, Takeyoshi. Uh, and next up is Johan. So Johan, we will get you set up and um, ready to go. We're going to get you to share your screen as well. Sure, thank you. Uh, so let me share my screen. So there we go. So. You can see your screen, over to you. You can, thank you. Uh, hang on a moment, I just need 
few seconds. Sure. So now, okay then. Um, my name is welcome. My name is Ewan Spore. I'm the engineer manager of Global Language Services at Inca Group, Group Digital. And we provide solutions, knowledge, and best practices uh, to better connect content creators, developers, and linguists to simplify localization in IKEA. And what I'm going to talk about is how we democratize multilingual communication by a PM-less approach to continuous localization. So uh, a lot of people connect us with the instructions. That is actually where a lot of people start. But that is quite, start with the live in the furniture. But preceded by that has been a number of steps in the customer journey. And uh, it has probably been from the late catalog, from ikea.com with the number of microservices, which we translate from the mobile apps, the videos, e-learning, or internal communication, a lot of text which has been produced. And all this text has been submitted to the countries in English. They localize it. So then they localize all the thing in the countries. And this is a cooperation between the co-workers and our translation agencies. And this is the beauty of it because it's proofread translated by the co-workers who know the language and is well aware of what a customer wants. And IKEA operates in 58 countries where we have about 38 languages. And when we started to implement translation technologies or language technologies a couple of years ago, it was really about lower cost. That was our focus. But when we implemented translated chat, we realized that 70% of the users that contacted our internal IT support, they actually used machine translated chat because they wanted to communicate in their own language. And we, what we then realized, languages and the technology is really a way of include the many, the many co-workers. So what we have done now in our approach, oh, sorry. What we have done in our approach is to keep the current crowdsourcing model of translation management and benefit then from the new technologies. That we are doing then by upskilling our coworkers so we can empower them to excel. We pull data from the countries to improve the translations. We harmonize and automate the model which they work in. And when this all is ready and we have the data, we can then push out the translations into the countries and still use the skills of the coworkers so they can continue to do the localization. Is this an innovation? Well, I don't really know, but it include, makes it possible for continue to work with inclusion, with upskilling, harmonization, a PMless approach for all content to reach our customers and coworkers faster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. Thanks, Johan. Uh, very, very uh, interesting and to the point. Thanks for that. Uh, Dragons, do we have questions? Yeah, I do. So I mean, what you presented is more of an approach. So is there a platform behind which supports this? I mean, if you need to have a PM-less uh, workflow and you talk to many people who typically do other things than localization, how do you tie them in? Uh, I mean, of course, we need a backend. And we are actually implementing the backend as a translation management system. And then we are building an orchestrator around where we will enable the many co-workers to work in a simplified way towards an ordinary translation management system. And do you have developed a special customized or special editor for this? Because I, I assume that normal IKEA workers will not work, will not know how to use a CAD tool or anything. So you would have to have something extremely simple. Yep. And we are working on that. And we will have a demo of that in mid June. Um, yes, I have a, I have a question. Um, it sounds like uh, I like this idea of the the democratization, and, and your employees are um, uh, IKEA employees are are included in the process. I, it's sort of difficult for me to uh, know without knowing the details of the program what what makes it unique. But so let me ask you: um, compared to other companies that you know have uh, other localization programs, what would you say is, is what makes your program unique? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, actually this was initiated by my team because they saw this when they have worked with other companies, they saw that 
we don't have, we, what we are using and our crowdsourcing is based upon that we use the people in the countries, the actual people working in the stores, in the warehouses, in the service offices, and using their skills. Uh, and they say, they told me that actually this is different from other programs as we don't have trained linguists doing the job. So we are continuing to work with this and really work with inclusion and democratizing solution, enabling them to use the technologies also. So we have a number of examples also where we have technologies where people in the stores actually use our translation to come and communicate with uh, customers. So, so it sounds like if I can paraphrase, um, the, the fact that you're using your customers as part, your internal customers, the employees as part of the, the suppliers is, is a unique um, characteristic of the program. Yeah, it's a unique characteristic. We can just see that we in, in January, we identified it 350 people that we, that we are now working with proofreading. And as we dig further down, further out in the countries, we expect, we expect to reach plus 2000. Cool, thank you. I, I, I have a follow up question to this because you said you're, you're, you're working for global language services and this is a company wide effort, right? So usually localization team um, struggles with um, this type of uh, effort company wide, who is supporting this? I mean, is this top down or the C class is uh, promoting or this is a bottom up effort? Yes. So it's, <laughs> it's coming from the team. No, it's, it's actually, it's both. Uh, because what we have done is that we have reached out into the countries and asked them for their pain points and worked to solve their pain points. So by that, we get their support. Okay. So that is one way. So we have reached out to a lot of people that are working with translations mm -hmm. today and see mm -hmm. that we can really include them. And that has meant oh. that we actually have support from their side too. Okay. All right. It makes sense. A, a great, a great, uh, great way of... Uh, achieving something great. Thank you. Wow. I, I have a question for you, Johan. A couple of years ago, I was at um, a retail show and a senior director from Inca Group was there and talking about um, the overall strategy uh, for developing countries in particular and the role of the store and, and how uh, IKEA and the brand was evolving for that market does that come into play in this strategy yourself and in, in how you deal with those markets too um now can you please repeat your question there i am dave can you take it again yeah sure yeah yeah i, I don't did you hear the quote all of it or some of it i, I heard a question but i really what was the question about what was it yeah. going to be included so it, it for developing countries, does the strategy that you're taking with the crowdsourcing idea that you uh, just showed us, is, is that covering those countries as well? Uh, you mean developing countries? Is that new countries coming in or is it countries with um, which type of countries? So countries, for example, um, in, in India and, and some of those uh, regions where IKEA maybe 10 years ago didn't have uh, any presence at all? Mm. No, we, we actually, we have the same uh, philosophy everywhere that we want to include as many as possible. And we, that, that is the best way to capture the, the language is act from the coworkers. And then as we say, it, pu pulling it in as data and then we can reuse it. Okay. Great, thanks very much, Johan. Thank thanks, you. Johan, great job. Great. Next up, we'll have uh, Manuel. So Manuel, same with you. We'll have you share screen and uh, show us your idea. Okay, so I share... Okay, one second. Oh, so you, are you running? Are you running the... Um... 
Um, no, am I pres am I presenting from my own screen? I think in order to make the video good. work, it's best if we do it from yours. So I, mean, I, I, yeah, I do. I do the whole. Thing. Okay, fine. Here we go. Okay, can you see it? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so my name is Manuel Harans. I'm, I'm CEO of Pangeanic, and I'm here to introduce ECHO. Um, it's the platform that we've created and has been uh, offering, it has been servicing the market since late 2019. It's on version two. ECHO is an enhanced NLP services platform where users can interface and enjoy a number of benefits. Um, imagine what is about to happen um, in our industry from what has been happening for, for some years now, uh, but it's increasingly becoming a reality where machines run 90 to 98% human parity in a number of subjects, not just machine translation. That means it's a complete change of scenario to the kind of services that we provide to clients. Uh, I'm not speaking only about uh, post editing, but um, providing services that are fully automated to, to clients. So Echo aims to be the self-driving car of natural language processing, including machine, the adaptive machine translation, whereby users in a distributed way can add content, create, clone their engines, have children, um, children engines, <laughs> um, but also anonymize content, classify content, and run a number or a series of NLP processes. It is clear that we're not working now how we were working. We're not working, at, we don't run projects in 2021 as we used to do four years ago. But our vision is that in four years' time, most of the services that we offer, traditional NLP, uh, traditional translation services, will be gone. And a number of other NLP services will come in, into will come to substitute them. Echo, uh, like I said, adapts engines. Uh, users uh, enjoy the power to create clones, clean the data they upload, uh, produce bilingual data when they only offer, when they only come with monolingual data, and then create children specialized engines for, uh, from different points. So Manuel can start an engine from a general engine and create a medical engine, then Alex, takes over three retrainings later because he enjoys very much that bio engine and then stop it there because it's working very well. He doesn't want any more retrainings, but I fork off and then I specialize my, my engine into biomedicals or, or, another, or another client. Back to this, the other clients such as anonymization, which is increasingly becoming uh, important for ISO purposes, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2701 information securities, information security, so that the, the content that we produce and share is it becomes anonymous. Obviously, we don't we can't release client names, personal data, and other and other um, details. Um, so, how far are we from the translation industry becoming a data factory? In fact. Uh, for text, I think we're all there. Data is becoming a large chunk of translation services, parallel data, but that is going to lead a number of players to other areas within NLP. Image, voice, transcription, uh, data classification, and second et cetera. Line. Okay, so there are some early adopters of, of the platform from the Spanish TV to the Spanish tax, uh, tax agency, European Commission, and that was stats. I made it on time, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Manuel, yeah. thank you. The self-driving NLP, I like that. Um, one question is, what is exactly the innovation you're now presenting? Is it the whole Echo platform, which is pretty broad, as I've seen, or mm -hmm. one specific component, the anonymization, which you picked out? Mm, anonymization is fairly new, let's say is the, the flavor of the year in 2021, uh, but there are a number of processes within the platform. It, you, the, the innovation of it is that you can use one and, and it, 
and is very effective, or you can you can combine in an AI way several processes. So you can uh, create your uh, your own machine translation ecosystem, a farm of different engines with your own data, kill them, fly them up with with Kubernetes, and then anonymize content or not, or just run anonymization services, or just run classification services. Okay. We plan to add summarization towards Q4 in this year. So, in actual fact, you'll be able to translate or not, uh, anonymize or not, and then possibly translate and then summarize. Or summarize before you translate and then save cost. If I may follow up, I mean, classification, summarization, anonymization, translation, all these are complex fields in itself and the specialized companies taking care of so um, I mean, it's hard, of course, to be uh, industry state of the art on all these things. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this an open platform where you plug in, where you can also plug in other components? Or is the idea that the Echo platform kind of uh, attempts to cover all these fields in a state of the art quality level? There are, there are companies that offer similar, uh, that offer a platform, okay? In, I, we believe not with all the components that we that we offer, an animation for one, but um, I know of, well, at least one or two companies in the States, Informatica being one that offers a, a kind of similar service, um, especially classification and summarization. We want to become the, the, the self-driving car of NLP. Yes, they are, the, they are, special, they are specialist fields, um, our success is that we've been able to package them into one single platform. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question about uh, afterwards. I mean, you said self, self-driven car. So f from the, after you put the, the source until the, the, the transition comes out, you automate everything, right? Including anonymization. Yes, so the platform what, is API ready. So yeah. yes, but basically you can automate all the processes through. So when you anonymize, you have to put it back, right? And if the source language is, uh, let's say wording or something is not suitable for the target language, language do you have any ways to to manipulate is this any ai system mm. yes or not? yes yeah, yeah yes yes there is uh, you, you saw a very basic reduction uh, mm -hmm. example of anonymization in fact what is running behind is named entity recognition mm -hmm. so um, people are um, people's names are detected jobs are detected mm -hmm. uh, run down to any identifier uh, in order to make the text, the anonymized text, uh, GDPR compliant. So you can take things like uh, blonde, long hair, uh, political beliefs, religions, etc. anything that would identify you, okay, in a, in a real setting. Um, in the background, that has an identifier that that's mm -hmm. the system keeps. You can fully anonymize and then um, any trace is deleted there's no way of, of coming back and then you have black just uh, black data oh, okay. there all right or you can run the identifier and then that that identifier once translated it re is replaced by the person's name by the job specification blood group um, etc yeah yeah that, that's the reason why i'm asking if you put it back it, it, mm -hmm. some parts should be translated right um yes for example job titles yes <laughs> so there, there's uh, several uh let's say uh phases of translation i mean That's on right. the back end you have to translate all these things that put it back if you mm -hmm. put it back right yes uh, an index file is created that is separate mm -hmm. to the text and then you translate that separately okay, okay. or not okay so, so that's the difference with with a usual ai that is just one language maybe that's right well the system yeah. works right now in english french german mm. spanish brazilian portuguese japanese okay. okay it doesn't work in all languages yet mm. okay we're working to add italian and uh, 
Swedish and Chinese and a few more uh, as, as per demand. If you anonymize, okay, the short answer is if you anonymize somebody's name or mm -hmm. somebody's job title, well, why would you want to translate it? It's anonymized. You don't want it there. You, you want it deleted. You want the black box. Okay. Yeah. Right? So if you want, okay, okay, you're, you're thinking from a translator's point of view that I, I need to translate that. But when people use that, the, the anonymized version mm -hmm. typically doesn't, mm -hmm. must not contain that data. Okay. Do, do so you it's, not to, it's not to anonymize for, you know, to, to just to translate in the public place, but just anonymize. I understood correctly. Mm, yeah, anonymization can be can be inserted in a translation process, or mm -hmm. typically, most of the time, UK is is monolingual. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And that sort of reflected the nature of my question as well. So I'll, um, I think I'm good. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Muchas gracias, Manuel. Very <laughs> thank interesting. You, Manuel. Gracias, Dave. <laughs> And uh, next up, we'll have Jamie. So Jamie, we'll get you plugged in. I feel like if um, I'm following Manuel, I should be behind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the Spanish pronunciation, <laughs> absolutely. Well, <laughs> Jamie, Jaime, uh, ready when you are, sir. <laughs> yeah, maybe probably readier than I am. All right. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Uh, so I'm Jamie Punishall. I'm with Lion Bridge. Um, I think everybody hopefully knows who <laughs> Lion Bridge is. Um, so I won't go into 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 that definition. Um, I want to talk about our um, our predictive an new predictive analytics um, quality service um, and um, how we're using it to um, really in, in in making it available for customers in multiple places to really. Um, frankly, get us to the self-driving localization process. I'm going to steal from Manuel as liberally as I uh, as I can. If you could go to the first slide, um, you, you know, and you think you think about the problem, and this this happens in every industry. As you start to automate more, um, your flaws are amplified. Um, so if we don't have really optimized um, source and uh, um, and ingredients and really optimized process, you're just scaling garbage. So you're going to do a lot more bad faster. Um, and so really, as we move to the machines, we've got to purify our source. As an industry, we've typically done quality at the end of the process, which is great um, to tell us how well we did. Um, but we really need to move to this quality, um, this quality everywhere uh, universe where we're pairing source analytics and target analytics. Um, and, and in our case, you know, we've got a, a select um, uh, optimized corpus. You know, we've got about 50 billion words, um, but we're using about a half a billion that we're using to test um, the efficacy of all the source content. So we go to the next slide. Uh, what we've done is we've taken um, uh, about 120 diff 28 different data points, which as best as we can tell is, is more than anybody else is, uh, is using. And we're starting um, to use them across these six main categories uh, from judging you know, source readability across all the different ways in which we can do that. Um, when we tune those models based on kind of content, et cetera to linguistic scoring, um, to some of the newer things that um, uh, customers are demanding, you know, judging um, offensive terms, inclusivity, um, and again, really trying to stop um, uh, source content that isn't ready for either the machine or even really for a human driven process from making its way into the process. So if you move to the next slide, um, uh, then, uh, and we'll, we'll build this out. Um, you know, we sort of thinking about the content process over the top of the new big data universe that Manuel has set up for us, um, which is really quite exciting because it's allowing us to instrument everything. Um, and we're using these both in a setup phase and in, um, in an execution phase. So if you click um, once, please, you know, you think about, we could take these analytics and we really use it around empty optimization. Um, do both the source and target tests um, which tells us which engines, which training methods, um, and over time um, can identify the need for retrainings or adaptations of approach um, to, to the mix of machines and language pairs and domains um, that the machines are driving. If you click again, um, right, we now then can set a whole bunch of benchmarks and KPIs for overall what that content should look like coming through an organization. Um, and so now we're literally measuring every piece of source content and everything as it's moving through the process. Uh, next one. All right. 
Um, um, importantly, we can start to filter out things that have no business going into the process at all um, and start to create automated gates um, based on the thresholds that we set in two, um, should this even proceed to localization? Um, and if so, what's the right, what's the optimal approach? Will this go through straight unsupervised uh, MT um, or what are the levels of editing, review, um, enhancements, um, augmentation, et cetera, uh, that would, uh, that'll ensure the best possible outcome with the least amount of rework and redo. And then four. 10 seconds. Yep. Okay. Ultimately, this, what this gets us getting us to is lights out project management, right? Where we can have content coming in, being analyzed and, and flowing itself through. And if you click the last time, um, we can already see, you know, a whole bunch of, um, so hope, yeah, there we go. Um, on a whole bunch of dynamics, um, uh, a drastic improvement um, uh, up or down in the proper direction of up to 25% uh, improvement across all these different dimensions. I'll stop there. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Jamie, I, I uh, have a question. Um, predictive analytics, we've seen this used um, for content and localization, I think, you know, in, in various forms uh, over the last couple of decades. Um, in a few words, wh where do you see um, LimeBridge's implementation as being uh, unique? Yeah, so, I mean, this is, you know, the, the sort of like, you know, Apple Newton versus iPhone 12. Um, yeah, you know, the idea has been around, obviously, the quality of the data that, you know, and the amount of data that we have now, I think, is, um, is drastically improved. Um, we've got a heck of a lot more, um, you know, data coming out of, uh, you know, the, the 2,500 odd MT engines trained. So there's just a lot more insight. Um, and we've got those 128 data points um, that, uh, you know, we've we've been using in pockets, but I don't think we've ever brought them all together and, and really combined source and target optimization for use of an end-to-end -end process. So this is, because you can do it both at setup, you, you sort of set yourself up originally um, but I think we're really, what we're doing is we're now setting up to an instrumentation of the entire process at all times. So it becomes a self-learning engine. Um, and there's some really interesting long-term applications for this too, right? You can, you know, as a, as a marketer, I, you know, I think about UTM codes, which allow me to track the performance of a campaign um, from, you know, sort of an advertisement all the way through to somebody clicking on it, becoming a customer, renewing, et cetera. Um, and, and as an industry, we've always been really disconnected from the outcomes, right? Um, did that translation make an impact? Was it, did somebody read it more? Or were there more sales, et cetera? And this allows us to in, start to instrument that and actually get closer to helping to judge business outcomes and then using that as a feedback to localization optimization. The other thing I'd say to you is it's, I think for the first time, we're really giving the localization teams the ability to push back on source content departments with some real data as to why and how they need to improve their source in order to drive better localization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Anouk is saying from the, the audience that this is pro, uh, process innovation. It, it is, uh, she's saying collaborate, uh, because it's collaborative workflow, maybe you can focus on that side of innovation rather than, you know, just one function. And I, uh, being said that, I, I really like the way Lion Beach is focusing because in this AI era or MT era, garbage in, garbage out is uh, really true. And of course, you're saying that PM less, but I guess uh, you're creating other kind of human job. Where is human uh, contributing in this workflow? Yeah, so I guess the, the best way, the, the way I think about it is, you know, I, I, you, and again, this is true in any, anywhere you see major technology improved automation, right? You know, there's, there used to be lots of people running around a construction site with hard hats and pickaxes, digging holes and building bu buildings. Um, and now we see fewer of those, but they're still there. Um, mm -hmm. But we see backhoes and dump trucks um, and cranes. And lots of people then have to build those back backhoes and dump trucks and trains. Mm -hmm. Uh, cranes and sell them. And so I, I don't think we see this either as PM less or translator less. Mm -hmm. It is a move to a human exception management process, mm -hmm. which is the only way we hit the volumes and velocity and turnaround time of sort of the, the, the digital age. So you've got mm -hmm. a lot of now um, linguists playing, getting into that optimization setup phase, right? 
right? Yeah, this is what I um, mean. You're, yeah. you're tuning um, and you're identifying more and more that has to be routed through the, or, or uh, what can go through just machine versus mm -hmm. what can go through various forms of human touch. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So you sort of you create buckets of the factory depending on what you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to see where you implemented this human, uh, you know, interaction. But it's okay. Thank you. Yeah, we we've got it at every phase. Hmm? It, yeah, it's at every phase. I'm sorry. So go ahead. Point isn't that less of a technical problem because, as you said, we're doing this already for quite some time, and uh, I mean if the industry would be more concerned or have more influence about the content creation process, we would never have to translate a PDF, for example. But uh, normally it's more, less a technical, but more of an organization problem because the localization department just has to live with what they are getting. So That's uh, right. are you creating certain incentives in your business model to give uh, the localization departments of your customers more influence and more power to over the content creation process. So I don't think we've taken it to that level um, um, in terms of uh, adjusting the revenue or the compensation model. What we are doing, however, is, you know, to your point, um, we're trying very much to think about the overall business outcome set and how can we put the localization teams in a position to be able to put things back. So we had a real world example of this just in the last few weeks um, where something failed an LQA test um, and came back and the normal process would have been to say, okay, what happened, you know, let's blame the linguist, let's blame the translation process, what happened? Um, and the first thing the client did was be able to run the source analytics against the piece and say, this never should have gone through. Um, and now with that armed is now having a much different conversation with the marketing team that had submitted that particular piece of content. So we can already start to see where the local teams are now empowered in a way they weren't before to very specifically point out, this is either going to fail or it's going to cost us a whole lot more money and we're going to start pushing budget back to you. Um, so it just, it's changed, it's beginning to change the conversation. I think, you know, it's a, it becomes really interesting to start to think about, could you charge differently, um, whether, you know, it's, it's us or internally um, against that, but that's probably a few dominoes down. Okay, thanks. Yep. Very good. Um, th thanks for the questions there. Uh, I think we, we have one other point on the sort of fine tuning or self tuning aspect of this Manuel. You had a quick point to make? Yeah, very, very, very good, Jamie. Oh, hi, <laughs> um, Very good. I, I like it. It's very, it's very intelligent. The the only, I understand the process, and uh, it's very good. The only question that comes to mind is the, the self-tuning part of it. Is there an intelligence behind it that helps you learn from mistakes, from errors, or that you can set up or, is it case by case, client per client, where an engineer has to set um, the engine up? Right now, it's case by case, um, client by client. Um, I think we're in some early days on, you know, in, and I guess, uh, it's why I love the parallel of the self-driving car, um, <laughs> right? There's five stages to the self-driving car, right? And, you know, the reality is, you know, stages three to five are kind of a debate is, you know, when you can really turn on automation as a Tesla owner, I can tell you, um, the car does very funny things, um, um, even in self, self driving mode. Um, so I, I think we're in the phase of learning where one, one, we, you know, we've got to take all the analytics and pull them together Two, then instrument the entire system, then you've got to collect all the data. And then we have to watch, okay, if we were to turn this on automatic, what would have happened? Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, and that's really where we are is we're watching what it would look like if it was on full automatic without giving it the power to have full automation. Again, much like where we are in the self-driving universe, aside mm -hmm. from the crazy videos of people falling asleep in the back of their Tesla while the, you know, the autopilot is on. Yeah. Um, but in reality, you still want a human hands on those wheels watching for now. Um, mm -hmm. It's laying the groundwork for starting to move into a fully automated universe. Yeah. We're well, doing we all... it, you can see it, it's happening in lights out project management, but not so much in the self-learning mechanism. Okay, okay. Well, we, we all know the self-driving car that uh, the, the Amazons and the Apples and the Microsofts and everybody's working on is 10 years from now. Okay. We, we 
I'd agree with you. We're beginning to experiment on, on step two, step three, step four, uh, to let things go. Some things can be fully automated. We have, you have, I, I can see you, you part, parts of your process are fully automated already. That's right. That's right. And, and, and we're, we're getting, we're getting pulled to automate more and more and more of it. Oh yes. Right. Absolutely. And so the, the, these are built, these are built to be decoupled. We can use them just as you can mm -hmm. use them just as a source analytic. I can integrate with the customer workflow or we can integrate it fully into the TMS um, and, and let's start to run automatically. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Manuel. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, very interesting Pleasure. stuff. Good conversation. Good to have you here. Uh, and, and finally, uh, Rafael, get you going um yeah. you're not going to talk about car crashes or anything right okay. no no not really I'm, I'm going to engage in magic tricks really magic yeah. tricks <laughs> good, right. good yes. closing act well I, I, i'm the conjurer right that you mentioned conjurer. at the beginning says so i'm the one yes <laughs> i'm the magician the floor is the yours, Rafael. thank you right so hello everyone my name is Rafael Jaworski and i'm from xtm uh right and i'm going to show you a magic trick so let's go to the first slide um Let's imagine the following scenario. Um, a client approaches you and says, well, I have a huge translation project for you. All you see is those money bags right now, right? So, so you just imagine what, what you're going to, to earn on it. And so of course you're enthusiastic. So you say, fantastic, what is it? Well, it's thousands of pages of English medical texts. Great, yes, we've done medical text. I mean, that, that's the domain like uh, anything else. Yes, we can, we, can, we, we can deal with it. So we say, no problem. And what is the target language? And the client says it's Swahili, right? It's Swahili, the, the, the African language. And then your, your jaw drops a little bit because, uh, well, let's go to the next slide. Uh, say that you are able to find the translators of Swahili, enough translators of Swahili to do this large project. But can you give them a dictionary? Can you give them a translation memory from the medical domain? So things don't exist. I mean, they, they, they cannot be really, uh, uh, they, they are very hard to get. And the magic trick is, is about conjuring up those, those resources. Uh, first, what do you actually have? Uh, since you don't have any translations uh, from English to Swahili, let alone in medical domain, um, you do have something. You do have the internet, and you do have quite a lot of Swahili texts. And that's pretty much enough for, for, for the idea that I'm about to present. And the idea is on the next slide. Right, so, so here's uh, under the hood. Uh, what you do uh, with the text, and the text is is only in the in the Swahili language, and it's a pile of documents. It's 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 uh, unstructured and unlabeled and and raw text, right? It goes into the product of XTM, the interlanguage vector space that I, I talked about it during the local world uh, conferences and and on some some other occasions. Uh, you just put the text into this big brain of ILVS, and what you get is a probabilistic dictionary. Of, uh, of English and Swahili, where for every word pair, you get a prob probability score. Now, if you put the threshold on, say, 50%, then you get a provisional English Swahili dictionary of quite probable translations, like physician being Daktari, medicine being Dawa, or Dawa, I don't know. Uh, and you have a very rough uh, uh, dictionary of English uh, to, to Swahili. Then you use another part of XTMAI, which is the aligner. Uh, you feed the text, the Swahili text, uh, and some other texts from, from the internet in, into the aligner, and you are actually able to get some rough translation memory uh, that, uh, or, or a bilingual corpus that, that you can use for, for the translation or for training the, the MT. So you start with nothing, and you have some actual language resources. And that's my magic trick. Ta-da. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rafael. Uh, well done. We're waiting for the rabbit to come out of the hat, but maybe that's what you just did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Dragons, do you have questions for Rafael? Yes, I do. Rafael, sounds pretty cool. One question. Um, with this process, are you outperforming Google Translate, which does support Swahili? Oh yeah, oh, well, it, it does actually. It does actually support Swahili. Uh, actually, I can uh, outperform Google Translate uh, because I can select the texts which are very close to the text that I'm uh, about to translate. So for for that very specialistic task of creating resources for a certain translation project, it, it is actually possible to, to outperform uh, Google Google Translate. That, that's uh, purely because Google Translate is trained on. 
uh, more general texts, right? And and we can actually select texts which we really uh, like, which are really close to what we are about to translate. But with the Swahili, um, you will, it's not so likely that you find a lot of text for that specific domain you're looking at. So the more specific the text is, the harder it is, of course, to find such text. Eh? Yes, have you but run, that, yeah. Have you run tests where you try to benchmark the inter-language uh, vector approach versus um, uh, Google Translate? Uh, yes, but uh, not not in uh, but, but but it's not the, the kind of text, uh, tests that um, involves uh, evaluation of the of the MT engine uh, as as such, right? We uh, we actually evaluated the uh, the results of the aligner that I showed you, and we evaluated the um, basically the the dictionary that that we got, right? So so that that's the kind of thing that that we can uh, we, we we can actually evaluate, and that uh, that involves some. A human evaluation of of the resources rather than uh, than MT. The MT was uh, was like an example of what you could use those resources for. Mm, I understand, but what you could have done is, of course, translate text with Google Translate, then extract the terminology and compare it to uh, the terminology list you got out of the uh, interlanguage vector approach. That's right. Yes, that's that, that's that's one one thing. Uh, but actually, uh, Swahili is, was not the only language that we that we fiddled with. <laughs> the the other one was uh, Kenya Rwanda, and we also uh, dealt with a number of languages uh, from from India. One of the those uh, several of those official languages uh, in 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 India, where we actually could not get any Google translations at all. Okay. Yeah. Um. Rafala, in the uh, written um, pitch, uh, I read something about uh, part of this process requires one man week of some of a specialist time. Um, yeah. And I, I wanted to know what who is this specialist and, and what are they doing? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, I will answer the, the, the second question first, because uh, the, the task of, of the specialist is to acquire those uh, monolingual corpora, those, those texts. And the specialist is trained in uh, some uh, basic to advanced computer programming, computer scripting uh, that allows to uh, download uh, whole pages from from, from the internet, uh, and to and to put them in a structured um, structured let's say files, okay, like XML files for example. And uh, the, 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 these kind of specialists, uh, well, actually, uh, I, I'm an academic teacher, and uh, in, in the courses that I teach, I teach these skills to computer scientists and to uh, data scientists. So people with uh, either computer scientists or mathematical background can be very easily taught uh, these the skills because the tools to perform this are ready. So this is not a, a Swahili doctor in, in your example? Exactly, yes, yes. It's a, it's, it's a student who, who struggles to, to learn English, but he's very good at programming. So my question is, I mean, I was wondering, I was wondering what's the difference between uh, neural machine translation example and your example. And I think I understood that the using a monolingual corpora to create that kind of resources. And if you let the machine to translate, it's just machine translation, right? This is what it does, yeah. machine translation. But your innovation is not let the machine translation, but give it to the human. That's the innovation, is it right? That's right. It, exa exactly. Okay. Yes. That's 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 yes. That, that's a key point. We. Yeah. We don't okay. want to perform the, the translation uh, automatically. We want, we still want humans to perform the translation. We just want oh, okay, to okay, help okay. them. Yeah. All right. So that's the the marriage between uh, neural machine translation technique and human. Let's say exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. And, and maybe one time. final question, if I, oh, if yeah. I may. Um, uh, can anyone use this technique, or is this um, does this require the use of uh, XTM technology? Well, uh, th that's uh, that's a kind of technique that uh, that we first uh, are about to offer to our clients. Yes, but um, uh, especially for bearing in mind the, the fact that that the process involves using the internal XTM uh, technique of interlanguage vector space, the in the, the framework. And uh, also, it, it it requires the the knowledge how to train it and how to uh, how to use it. So um, so yeah. So basically, yes, we, we do offer it to to our clients really. Yes. 
but but the innovation could be um, extrapolated into other the idea yeah other, of course yeah. yes the, the idea is free to free to take as always yeah. yes yeah i mean uh, uh, just follow up question to this uh if we do it manually many pe people can do so i think that the innovation is that xtm does it automatically the part of creating uh, the 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 basis right yes exactly I mean, yes okay yes Right. Yes, and the, and the automation uh, comes in uh, where it's needed the most, where, where we do need some specialistic knowledge and some specialistic language, language skills. So we exchange this for the knowledge of a, of a computer scientist, a specialist who, who is only trained in, only, uh, only trained in, in downloading uh, content from the internet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Thanks very much, Dragons. Yes. Um, great questions there. And hey, well, you just heard all of our speakers today. So Takeyoshi, Johan, Manuel, Jamie or Jaime, <laughs> Rafael just there. Uh, great innovations. Thanks everyone for um, uh, pitching and, get, and answering the questions. Thank you for your questions. And uh, thanks to the Dragons, Yuka Jim and Hoken uh, for your questions. Um, that's kind of it, Alex, for today. Yeah. What's happening next? Well, first of all, just wanted to congratulate our innovators. Uh, fantastic. I thought everyone did a really great job. I'm excited to see uh, tomorrow. We've got five more uh, exciting innovators, and then we'll uh, we'll have our dragons deliberate, and soon we'll come up with some finalists for Loke Worldwide 44. We've recorded the session today, too, so that'll be published to uh, Loke World's YouTube channel, uh, if not today, by tomorrow. Uh, so we ask you to feel free to share that around. You will need to be uh, registered for Loke Worldwide 44 and able to, in order to be able to attend the final round uh but yeah wow what a great uh first round here today and uh just thrilled to see tomorrow as well bye thank you thank you thanks everyone. everyone see you tomorrow at the same time for round two everyone have a great day thanks <laughs> bye everyone bye-bye take care bye-bye